everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Arts in the City. We are coming to you from the James Gallery inside CUNY's Grad Center. We'll show you a few highlights from their new exhibit a bit later. But first, when gorgeous stained glass gets damaged, the artists who can step up to help are few and far between. Donna Hanover heads to the Gill Studio to see stained glass get a glorious makeover. When a beautiful stained glass window has been damaged by people or time, it goes to conservators who can bring these artworks back to their original glory. At the Gill Studio, owner Zach Green says one of the first steps is to make a wax rubbing like glazier Joe on Thin is doing here. This piece is probably 120 or 30 years old and it's gotta be taken apart. This document will show the, the size of the lead and the position of each lead so that when we take the window apart, we know exactly how to put it back together. They recently completed work on a huge window at the Church of the Heavenly Rest on Fifth Avenue. The west window overlooks Central Park. It's about 50 feet tall. It was built by the Whitefriar Studio from London in the 20s. So the window was beginning to deflect and, um, and, and bulge to the interior and the exterior under its own weight. The four vertical lancets and the tracery section above them were removed in about 150 separate panels and brought to the Gill Studio in Union City, New Jersey. The pieces of broken glass were repaired or replaced and the panels were partially re-leaded. It took about six months. Zach explained there are different ways stained glass is held together. The original medieval method of assembling a stained glass window would be to use uh, strips of lead that hold the pieces of glass together. So the, the lead would be a piece like this that has a channel on each side and a piece of glass fits into either side. A more modern method is with copper foil. We'll wrap each piece of glass with some copper around the perimeter. And when we set those two pieces of glass next to each other, we'll solder the copper edge of each piece of glass to the next one. It's sort of known as the Tiffany method, and uh, they developed that for putting stained glass lamps together. This is a window that Zach rescued from being demolished. It's a wonderful example of a technique that was developed in America called drapery glass. It's curved and three-dimensional, so it duplicates the effect of light falling on real fabric. A valued artist at the Gill Studio, Michael Davis, explains that drapery glass is very heavy, however, putting stress on the lead in the windows. This one from St. Paul and St. Andrew Church on West 86th Street in Manhattan is beautiful now, but it came to the Gill Studio badly damaged. It was falling apart. It was falling apart. And this part of the window literally came to us in a shoebox. In most stained glass windows, the faces and hands have actually been painted on. So painting is part of the conservation work. This piece is in pretty good shape. Mostly it's gonna be cleaned. This piece on the other hand has been horribly smashed. So all of these um, shards have been collected. They'll be glued back together and then the missing painted elements will be repainted. Zach got into stained glass as an apprentice with a family friend. His parents are his inspiration, and he has one of his mom's drawings showing his sister Jessie up on the wall. My mother has been an artist all her life, and I wish I had a fraction of her talent. And my father is a, a, is a skilled builder, and uh, I sort of think of stained glass as the intersection of art and construction. One of the studio's famed projects before Zach's time was conservation of the windows in the museum at Eldridge Street, a beloved synagogue that had fallen into disrepair. They also fabricated the very modern East Rose window for it, designed by artist Kiki Smith and architect Deborah Gans. It was made using a technique where the art glass is layered with silicone holding it together like glue. This is actually one of the mock-ups from the Eldridge Street Synagogue Museum. These stars have been etched from the glass with hydrofluoric acid and then uh, painted with glass paint to be this amber color. And, uh, and then some of the stars were actually gold leaf. Zach sometimes creates stained glass art of his own, and the studio also helps other artists who want to make new pieces. Meanwhile, they mostly do conservation of classic stained glass windows, They've just completed work, for example, on a window at Calvary Presbyterian Church in Staten Island. There are many fewer stained glass studios than there used to be, but luckily, some creative people are still drawn to this exquisite art. 
I love the power of colored light. There's something really striking uh, and exhilarating when that light is able to tell a story. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. You may have already noticed them, eye-catching images adorning your local bus stop or newsstand. They're part of a new exhibition from the Public Art Fund. We spoke with Clifford Prince King, the New York City-based photographer behind the work. Flashes of Intimacy in a City of Strangers. An exhibition from Public Art Fund presents new photographs by Clifford Prince King, revealing tender moments in the most public of places, on newsstands and bus shelters. The six-foot portraits explore themes of queer companionship and identity, something King says he didn't see represented as a child growing up in Tucson. The stories I want to tell are queer black and brown stories, because I feel like growing up I didn't see that in media a lot. I think Arizona was a hard place for me to find community queer community and community amongst queers who are also black and brown. The exhibition titled Let Me Know When You Get Home includes a series of images on 300 bus shelters across New York, Boston, and Chicago, as well as 30 newsstands here in the city. Katerina Stafopoulou is an adjunct curator at Public Art Fund. For Clifford, it was uh, pushing the boundaries of what the public is comfortable seeing. This intimacy, especially an intimacy between men, is something that people might not expect to see in the city streets. But it's about representation and engaging with a subject matter that is meant to educate, to inform, and to just spread these beautiful portraits of men throughout the city. There is a striking juxtaposition seeing the images on our city streets. Many of the photos depict lush, warmer weather in which time seems to stand still. This while commuters rush through their daily lives. I like for my work to feel timeless, like there isn't really a sense of time. And so I, I would hope that it kind of makes the viewer feel like they have some sort of hope to like maybe like the springtime or summer, but also just kind of playing with the idea of longing for a different place, somewhere that's not so familiar. What drew me to Clifford Prince King's work is that his imagery really stops you in your tracks. They, even though these are still photographs, it's very clear that there's a narrative. Something has happened right before, something's happening right after. And that sense of mystery and discovery in his imagery is something that I found very compelling. King, a self-taught photographer, explains the exhibition title, Let Me Know When You Get Home, references safe passage and friendship. But that sense of home has another meaning as well. Let me know when you get home to me is referring to finding a place within yourself where you can be comfortable sitting still with yourself and not needing, you know, external validation or external anything in order to feel complete. The exhibition will be on view through May 26th free to explore during and despite your commute. For more information, check out publicartfund.org. Now on view, Textures of Feminist Perseverance centers on the work of 17 female identifying artists and examines how women's daily experiences and contributions are recorded in physical, virtual, and social public spheres. The art on display was created using varying forms and techniques, including sculpture, painting, street art, archival research, needlepoint, and zines, self-published, independently produced mini-magazines. Many of the pieces feature hands-on and labor-intensive practices that focus on the materials used, the concept of social gathering, and awareness of time. 
The exhibit asks the viewer to consider how to visually honor and represent the accomplishments of women. The exhibition is open until June 7, 2024. Check out centerforthehumanities.org for more information on the James Gallery. Technology meets creativity at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Andrew Falzone checks out a computer program dating back decades that uses artificial intelligence for art making. I would like them to question notions of creativity, of authorship, and of agency in these softwares, and really think about what art making means. When it comes to art from a computer, is it still art? The exhibit Harold Cohen Aaron would likely suggest it most certainly is. Dr. Christiana Paul is the curator of digital art at the Whitney Museum of American Art and organized the exhibit, which focuses on some of the first art to be produced by an artificial intelligence and the artist who wrote the code. Harold Cohen's work is so important because he created the first artificial intelligence software for art making. And Cohen gave that software the name Aaron, a reference to the figure from the Bible anointed as a speaker for his brother Moses. Aaron is early artificial intelligence, and that was so-called symbolic AI, expert systems that functioned on the basis of rules. So everything you are seeing in the galleries is based on rule sets that Harold Cohen wrote for this software. That's a very different approach from more modern AI systems. Today's AI is statistical AI that has been trained on massive data sets of images that are associated with text and you then generate an image on the basis of text prompts, but it involves a lot of optimization, standardization based on pre-existing images. That means today's modern AI systems like OpenAI's Sora Video Generator can create new images or videos based on huge databases of images and scenes they've already been shown. For example, the simple prompt, historical footage of California during the gold rush creates an incredible realistic scene like this one, though nothing in the scene is real. Aaron works quite differently. Aaron has not been trained on anything pre-existing. Aaron has been written in sync with Harold Cohen's aesthetics and take on representation in art. Which means Cohen wrote a very long list of rules for Aaron to follow when it creates art. I want to emphasize that there still is a lot of room for uh, creativity and agency by the software itself in arriving at a composition, but Aaron has knowledge about the external objects in the world and internally about representation. So Aaron definitely knows about how an artist would represent a figure. And Aaron understands skin tones and colors. So you never see any um, weird color combinations, but everything is very much in sync with Harold Cohen's uh, aesthetics. What makes the Harold Cohen Aaron exhibit so unique is that not only is there art already up on the walls, but there's also art in process. These two drawing machines were recreated by the Whitney Museum and they're running some of Harold Cohen's original software. It was very important um, to us to also include drawing devices and have Aaron drawings plotted live as they would have been in the early days. So this is the first time since the 1990s that the Aaron software is creating life. The museum went through what Paul describes as a very involved process of resurrecting different iterations of the Aaron code to run the plotters. Over the course of the exhibition, we will generate probably up to 5,000 drawings on these plotters, which are running most of the time. The Whitney Museum has permission to select as many of them as we want for our exhibition archive, and the rest will be returned to the Harold Cohen Trust. In addition to the drawing machines, which will be creating physical work that will hang on the Whitney's walls as part of the exhibit, 
exhibit, there will also be large scale projections of two versions of the Aaron program, one creating figurative outputs and the other generating images of flora. I would like uh, people to take away from this show that there are multiple approaches to art making with AI, that there is a lot to pursue when it comes to creativity. Thanks to some very generous donations to the Whitney, they are now able to offer free admission at select times. Visitors can enter for free on Fridays from 5 to 10 p.m. and all day on every second Sunday of the month. Admission is limited and tickets are required, but can be reserved through the museum's website in advance. You can also find an audio tour of Aaron available on the website as well. If you'd like to check out Harold Cohen Aaron, it'll be here at the Whitney until May 19th. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City on CUNY TV. There's no place like our hometown to find cutting edge art, and that includes movie making. For 16 years, the New York Indie Film Festival has showcased low budget and emerging filmmakers. Neil Rosen sat down with the festival's executive director. Since 2009, the New York City Independent Film Festival has provided a showcase for the best independent cinema from New York City and around the world. Their aim is to discover talented domestic and international indie filmmakers and embraces fresh ideas. And they've accomplished that by screening over 2,700 movies from 96 countries since its inception. The festival's aim is focused on low budget and emerging yet overlooked filmmakers, bringing their talent to culturally enrich the New York City community. Dennis Siri is the founder and executive director of the New York City Independent Film Festival. We are truly international, and, and that, that's, that's one of the things that set us apart. The number of countries represented this year is probably gonna be about 22 to 24. We've had movies about, uh, documentaries about what's going on in India, uh, about what's going on inside of uh, Africa, and a, a lot of films about the environment and climate change and the social injustice that comes out of it all. We have had people from Vietnam, Iran, Malta, Cuba, and that's, that's our goal, is to, is to give a voice to people who do passion projects. They do things they strongly believe in, they use their own savings, they max out their credit cards, and they do it all for the love of the art of making a movie. Among this year's movie highlights from Germany, Junio Mystica, about a woman's mysticism movement in the Middle Ages. From Iran, Warning No Swimming, about existential loneliness. From France, there's Synthetic Love, a narrative revolving around a lonely middle-aged woman who dreams of having a relationship with a peculiar gas station attendant. Cats and Husbands, an American dramedy about a young couple's challenges with in vitro. So are you still planning that trip? It's been really hard since we spent everything. Oh, honey, the in vitro. But if you could just let that all go, I mean, hell, I'll take care of the cat. And Nancy Joy, a poignant documentary from the UK about the remarkable story of a World War II survivor. Did you ever think that you wouldn't see your family again? No, I thought I would. I thought I would. But I uh, didn't. And that's just a few of the many interesting films you'll find at this year's festival. One of the reasons for the New York City Independent Film Festival and why it's exciting is the fact that if you're kind of bored with your life or you're bored with, with, with you know, the formula movies and after you've watched them all and you're like, well, what else is out there? Where was else is out there? You're going to see movies that do not follow the formula. So if you come to the festival, one of the things that is true is we have Q and A's at the end of every movie and the filmmakers are up there talking to people and we let them ask questions. And then afterwards, they all go to the bar and they hang out at the bar and they're more than willing to talk and hang out and that's why they come. They didn't travel to the New York City Independent Film Festival for the two hours of their movie. They came here because they're looking for the community, they're looking to hang out, they're looking to mingle, and that's what they're doing. They'll do that in the bar and they'll mingle with you and they'll hang out and talk and you'll get to talk to three, four, five filmmakers talking about movies and you'll get an opportunity to join in that conversation. The festival takes place here in Manhattan at the Producers Club on 44th Street right off of 9th Avenue. For ticket information and more information about the New York City Independent Film Festival, go to their website at nycindieff.com. For Arts in the City, I'm Neil Rosen.
marital and workplace bliss. Scott Kirby sat down with a couple whose behind the scenes work both on and off Broadway sets the stage for happiness at home. I was pregnant with our first child when we were doing Spring Awakening on Broadway. And we'd been working together all day, you know. We would leave the theater to go home and we would just talk about the scene we had just done like for 45 minutes and then, you know, take a little break and then talk about it the next morning on the way in. There's something about, you know, having an idea over breakfast that you can't replicate with someone you don't live with. For Lucy McKinnon and Ben Stanton, it's all about collaboration. They love sharing their work as well as their lives. He's a lighting designer, she's a projection designer working in video for the stage, and together they make quite a team. While working on shows on and off Broadway, they also teach at Brooklyn College and raise two young sons. When we work together, we do tend to work as a team. It's almost like one person doing both. That's right, <laughs> that's right. And, and we work extra hard to try to make a sort of a seamless presentation. So we love it when people can't really figure out if it's lighting or projection. I have a whole process. As, as a projection designer, I'm usually working on a show for weeks or maybe months before we get into the theater just to create content and to storyboard the show. And whether or not we're working on the show together, Ben sees all of that work, we talk about it. It's only better if he is the lighting designer because then by the time we get into the theater, he's very, very clear on what we're doing and I've already gotten all his notes. <laughs> <laughs> about what, what could make it better, you know? Neither planned to be in their current profession. Before Ben found his way to theater, he studied music. As a drummer, I had so many ideas I couldn't realize. And as a lighting designer, I felt free to dream and figure out the logistics later. And it was really exciting. And to this day, being a drummer and being a musician and having that sensitivity, uh, I, feel, I feel like it adds a lot of depth to my work and, 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 and I use these analogies in teaching all the time. Lucy had been a literature major at Harvard, but after college she saw a production that changed her life. I saw this piece by William Kentridge, his version of the magic flute at BAM, and it just like, it, it was one of the, it's kind of corny, but it was one of the moments when I thought like, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to learn to do like, that, because that's amazing. Ben and Lucy's love of theater brought them together and has become a foundation of their partnership. Our first Broadway show together was Deaf West's revival of Spring Awakening. Don't touch me. And I loved working on that show. Me too. It was a beautiful show. Michael Arden directed it. Because it was Deaf West Theater, there was a couple of like really specific design mandates that made it really interesting too. Not just articulating faces, but articulating arms and, and, and chests and, and having to think about the entire body in a different way was fascinating. And then also, I feel like from a video point of view, there was, you, you know, in addition to creating artwork, you were also helping to clarify lines and putting text on stage. And I don't know, it was just, it was a great challenge. And I think the best theater is made when you take risks. Ben feels the key to taking risks is communication. I feel very comfortable taking risks because I've learned over time how to get everyone on board. And a lot of my classes revolve around communicating ideas. As a lighting designer, I can't really show people what the lighting's gonna look like ahead of time, so I need to be able to talk about it. Lucy and Ben work hard to integrate their outside work into their teaching. We also both bring our students into the theaters where we're working, which I feel like has been really great. Last year I brought my students into Kimberly Akimbo, Christmas Carol. They were able to meet the engineers who worked with me, the programmers, see the whole systems, and sit through tech rehearsals, which are, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a really cool thing to see. They get introduced to all these different roles. You know, they might be in that theater and say, actually, I want to do that, you know, which I think is great. I had an undergrad last semester who had expressed to me that he wanted to be a Broadway carpenter. And so I was doing a play called The Collaboration at the Friedman Theater on Broadway, and I said, meet me on you know, Saturday morning, spend the day here. I mean, I don't know how to become a carpenter, but that guy does. School, theater, family. 
In the end, it all comes back to collaboration. You know, the people that we get to work with and the people in our lives, uh, it's like a real gift. So I think it's, it's also just what I've always done. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything else. And it's also partly what we do together. And it's what you know, we do like, together. Like it's if what we, we just know. went off and did something else, our whole world, our, I don't know. We met doing our, this. Our life would be <laughs> changed. It's, uh, it's true. Yeah, I think, um, That's a you good know, point. it's not just the people in the rooms. Like we are both designers who've kind of built a life together. And it's, it's nice to, um, you know, to stick with it to see where it goes. Yeah. Again. I'm Scott Kirby for Arts in the City. That is our show for today. Thanks so much for watching. A quick reminder to check us out on social media. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Arts in the City.